The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to your Reckon and Nexia Australia Monthly Tax Update webinar. My name is Vicky and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately one hour. The Reckon and Nexia Australia Monthly Tax Update webinar will cover recent tax developments in Australia. Our presenter today is Roloff van der Meer. Roloff is the National Tax Director of Nexia Australia and is responsible for ensuring that Nexia stays on top of all the latest tax developments. Roloff has the ability to deliver technical tax information in an easily understandable and commercial format to tax and non-tax people. I'll now hand you over to Roloff. Thank you very much for that introduction, Vicky. <coughs> yes, my contact details is on that slide. I have a fairly long email and there's my phone number. If you have any questions, please give me a call. Um, we'd love to talk to you about different ideas, etc. Um, just a very important part of this presentation, our disclaimer. Note, I'm not giving advice. And even if you believe I've been giving advice, I haven't given advice. Uh, please speak to one of your representatives or tax professional if you want to implement any strategies you may hear in this presentation. Anyway, overview. Um, as always, I've subdivided this presentation into seven uh, subheadings, uh, headings uh, for logical purposes, tax issues affecting companies, tax issues affecting family businesses, tax issues affecting indirect taxes, tax issues affecting individuals, international tax issues, superannuation tax issues, and other tax issues. Um, note with the government, we have a new government or a while back, a new government. There's new ministry in the corridors of power. There's a list of new names. Our new treasurer is Josh Frydenberg. Of course, our old treasurer, Scott Morrison, is now the prime minister. Okay, we're going to start off with tax issues affecting companies. So uh, please note, this is an update on tax events that happened in October. So some of these things may have received royal assent since then. But anyway, as we go through, there's some bills that are currently before Parliament. Um, one of the big bills with all this change in the corporate tax rate, etc., was a Treasury Law Amendment, Lower Taxes for SME Businesses Bill Act 2018. It received royal assent on the 20th of October, just speeding up the gradual race to the bottom for all companies. What I mean by gradual race to the bottom is just that now companies will be taxed at lower rates. As you can see there, the current year remains, oh, apologies. Uh, if you have a turnover of under 50 million, you're you'll be taxed at 27.5%. For 2020, the rate stays the same. For 2021, it was, or the current law was always 27.5% will be taxed for turnover under 50 million in 2021. Now the new law says you'll be taxed at 26%, then 2022 tax at 25%, etc. Um, we all know about the problems with the franking or the difficulties applying the franking rules. So it will be very interesting to see how we all adjust the franking credits, etc. Family business tax issues. There's some bills that are currently before Parliament. Uh, one of the very important bills that have since received royal assent on the 3rd of October 2018 deals with small business CET concessions. As you know, um, we have a lot of SME clients, so this is particularly relevant for these kind of clients. Um, this basically imposes more conditions from the 8th of February 2018 if a person or a small business entity Sells, sells shares or units in a company or trust. In such a case, if you sell shares or units, additional conditions need to be satisfied in order for the small business concessions to potentially apply. As we all know, to qualify, or well, there's four different kinds of small business concessions, the 15 year um, exemption, if you've basically owned a business for 15 years, has been active for at least half that time, and you sell it, you can get the, any gain you've made can be tax free. Then we have the retirement exemption, the rollover exemption, and a rollover CT, 50% rollover. And then last, you have the replacement asset rollover. 
good. Anyway, these rules only apply if you sell shares or units after the 8th of February, if you sign the contract, etc. when the CDT event happens, if that occurs after the 8th of February, 2018. The three additional conditions, there's a conditions they impose on the taxpayer, that is the entity that sells the shares or units. The object entity is the entity in which the shares or units are sold. And there's a modified active asset test. Under the modified active asset test, can be very complicated. It's just basically you trace through to the assets of a later entity to see if they satisfy the 80% rule that applies to determine whether there's active assets. Why are these changes there? It's basically to prevent the concessions from being inappropriately applied to interests in large businesses. So one of, as I mentioned there, there's changes to the object entity requirements. The object entity must now also meet the 6 million net asset value or the 2 million turnover test. So um, here's an example of before the 8th of February, if a person wanted to sell shares in a large trading company, in this case, we have Richie Rich, earning 25% of shares in a large trading company. With, uh, it's a large trading company because there are $100 million of assets and it has $20 million of turnover. So it doesn't satisfy the $6 million net asset value test, or and it's also not a CET small business entity. So this scenario, we have Richie Rich, he wants to sell 25% of these shares. If he tries to apply the small business CET concessions at the moment or before the 21st of February, it wouldn't succeed because um, Richie Rich itself is not a CET small business entity or satisfy the 6 million net asset value test. So Richie Rich thinks for himself and he comes up with the following solution. He buys a CET small business entity corner store in his own name. The turnover of the corner store is only 500,000. Now Richie Rich is a sole trader with a turnover under $2 million, so qualifies as a CET SBE. Under the old rules, before the 8th of February 2018, he sells. There's only a requirement to check whether the taxpayer is a CET SBE. So Richie Rich is because he sold the corner store. Um, he sells it in a huge company. It doesn't matter. He does qualify. After the 8th of February, this is no longer possible. Um, let's just start in the beginning and then I'll come to why it's no longer possible. So the basic conditions to qualify for CDT small business concessions, the taxpayer, that's Richie Rich in the previous example, must be either a CDT small business entity or a partner in a CDT small business entity partnership. On its own, Richie Rich is not a CDT small business entity, but having bought the Quickie Mart or the corner store in its own name, He's become a sole trader with a turnover under 2 million. So tick, he satisfies the first condition. Or the taxpayer satisfies 6 million net asset value test. Unfortunately, Richie Rich has more than 200 million in assets. So he doesn't satisfy the 6 million net asset value test. However, that's not necessary because he satisfied the first condition. He's a CT SPE. And the asset must satisfy the active asset test. The asset must be used in the business. Uh, normally, it's satisfied through a, a modified uh, active asset test, as we said before, where if you sell shares, normally 80% of those shares are active. Uh, sorry, 80% of the underlying assets in the company in which shares are sold are active. Then there's also certain concession specific conditions that need to be satisfied, depending on whether you go for the 15 year exemption, the retirement exemption, CET rollover, et cetera, whatever concession you go for. And under the rules before the 8th of February, if you sell shares or units, there's additional basic conditions if you sell the shares or units. These conditions basically says if an, if an individual holds shares or interests that are sold, the individual taxpayer or spouse must be a CET concession, concession stakeholder in the object entity. What's a CET concession stakeholder? It's basically if the taxpayer owns 20% or more of the voting and distribution rights held by its individual or spouse in the object entity. 
if he owns, let's say, the individual only has, say, 10%, not a CT concession holder, and can't qualify for these concessions when shares are sold. However, if a company or trust holds shares or interests that are sold, all CET concession stakeholders in the object entity must hold at least 90% of the interest in the company or trust taxpayer. So it all has to do with numbers. Um, after the 8th of February, there's additional conditions that need to be satisfied if shares or units are sold. As I put in there in this slide, the same, same, um, that's the same condition one as under the law pre 8th of February. However, if you sell shares or units after the 8th of February, you have to satisfy three additional conditions as well if you sell shares or units. First additional condition you have to satisfy, the taxpayer must satisfy the 6 million net asset value test or carry it on a business just before the shares or interest were sold. Uh, this requirement is basically here to prevent people just like um, creating fictions to be able to satisfy these conditions. The second new condition, that's point three on that slide, is the object entity must now also be a CET small business entity or satisfy the $6 million net asset value test in the year of sale. Note, this is a new requirement because in our example here, where Richie Rich sold his shares in a large trading company, that's the object entity, there were e uh, Richie Rich could still qualify doing these uh, moves that he did, buying a corner store, even though um, he's selling shares in a huge company. Note from the 8th of February, it would not be possible anymore what Richie Rich did, because you also look at what the object entity, the object entity must also be a CD small business entity, etc. And then the third new condition, that's point four here, is the shares or interest in the object entity must satisfy a modified active asset test. As I alluded to before, if you sell shares in a company or business, normally you have to satisfy 80% rule, meaning a share can only be active if at least 80% of the asset of the, un of the entity in which you are selling the shares, the object entity, is active assets, i.e. assets used in the business. Under the modified active asset test, it can get a lot more complicated. You have to trace through further as well. Note to determine whether, going back to point three on the slides, to determine um, which entities are connected with an object entity, you may remember to work out whether you satisfy the two million turnover test or six million net asset value test, you must also count either the turnover or assets of entities that are connected with the object entity, um, you might, and then include that to determine whether you breach that. Normally connected with is a 40% concept, so only count the assets and the turnover of say companies or trusts in which you own more than 40%. Under these object entity tests and the um, test for the modified active asset test, to determine when an entity is connected with, an entity will be connected with uh, if the interest own interest um, of ownership is only 20%. So potentially a lot more entities, um, they, they, they need to have their turnover included or their net asset value included as well. So it can potentially push you over the limit, et cetera. Um, anyway, these tests are very complicated. Please speak to a next year representative or a tax, tax professional where you can. There I just put schematically all four conditions. So if you look at condition number one, that is the current condition that applied before the 8th of February 2018. Um, conditions two to four, it's not no longer proposed. It is law at the moment. That applies from the 8th of February 2018. So condition one, you must have CT concession stakeholders. Note the first example on the left, I have a taxpayer that sells the shares directly. So the taxpayer is the taxpayer. In example two, we have uh, individuals owning shares in a company or trust that, and the company or trust is the taxpayer because the company or trust sells shares or units in a company or trust, that's the object entity. So as I said, condition one, we've gone through that, that's current 
uh, deployed before and after the 8th of February. Condition 2, two, two 3 and 4 only applies after the 8th of February. Condition 2 uh, places additional conditions on the taxpayer, saying the taxpayer must satisfy either the 6 million net asset value test or must have carried on a business just before the sale. Condition three, as to the deal with the object entity, there's a modified CDT small business entity test or satisfy the 6 million net asset value test. That's also modified. In this case, uh, it's because of the connected with, it's just 20%, no longer 40%. Note as well, entities that control 20% or more of this object entity, you don't need to include their turnover or net asset value. Then condition four, uh, that's the modified active asset test, says shares or interest in the object entity must satisfy the modified active asset test, i.e. 80% or more of the assets in our object entity and the entities that are 20% connected with must be active. So it can be quite complicated computations. It's very important with this change, go through your client groups and especially identify entities controlling more than 20%, but say less than 40% in other entities, because that's a new thing to determine the term connected with. So you might have qualified for as a CT SBE, i.e. 2 million turnover or under 6 million net asset value in the past, but because of this change, this may potentially push you over the benchmark and you may no longer qualify for CT small business entity concessions. Moving on to another point, fighting against the cash economy. There's a new bill that received royal assent on the 3rd of October 2018, dealing with taxable payment reporting in cleaning and courier industries. Um, this applies from the 1st of July 2018. So people in cleaning and courier industries, because the government believes there's a lot of cash, people getting cash wages, they don't declare it, etc. So um, the government or it is a new measure that applies from this year. You only need to lodge a taxable payment annual report by the 28th of August, 2019. But in short, this is akin to people in the building construction industry, where the government also believes a lot of people there are paid cash in hand that the people don't really declare. So it's basically using data matching and uh, making sure that people in the building construction industry say employers, they lodge a taxable payment annual report by the 28th of August to the ATO, and then the ATO can compare what these people have allegedly paid their employees versus what their employees, or let's say contractors, contractors is probably a better word, not employees, what the contractors have actually declared as receipts on their receipts of cash for doing work in their building industry or cleaning and courier industries in their tax returns. And if there's any problem, um, the ITO will definitely follow up and audit them. Also, what's new law from the 4th of October 2018, don't use electronic sales suppression software. A lot of people allegedly not acting in the cash economy. They say they have a BPAY machine, etc., but they also bought a you know, electronic sales suppression software um, that, you know, hides the transactions from a computer. Um, the ATO also says, you know, it's a penalty. If you supplied such a sales suppression software, you'll get five year jail or 5,000 penalty units. If you use that, you'll get two year jail and 500 penalties. And it applies from the 4th of October, 2018. Other issues dealing with the cash economy, no more tax deduction on, or on contractor or wage payments if no withholding. This has since become law. It basically says from the 1st of July 2019, an employer or people who employs other employees or contractors who makes payments to them of say salary and wages that is subject to PAYG withholding and no PAYG withholding is withheld. In such a case, Normally the employer just claims a tax deduction for salaries paid. But if the employer did not withhold according to PAYG, then the employer can't claim a deduction. Point number four, taxable payment reporting to road, freight, IT and security providers. 
it's exactly the same rationale as the taxable payment reporting cleaning and courier industries, as well as to building construction industry. So it's also about the taxable payment reports on the 28th of August each year, so that they can compare what was allegedly paid versus what the contractor reported in the, in the contractor's tax return. Uh, there's a bill that received royal assent dealing with the immediate deduction for fodder storage assets. You get an immediate write-off for fodder storage, for example, silos or grain storage sheds, if the fodder was installed already for use from the 19th of August 2018. It replaces the current three-year write-off that exists for fodder storage assets. Anti-avoidance rules for circular trust distributions. As you may remember, in this year's budget, they proposed uh, and they, that, they, that they will address this issue. The government has started and they've released draft legislation on circular trust distributions. These anti-avoidance rules applies or is proposed to apply because currently uh, the anti-avoidance rules only apply to closely held trust distributions. It's proposed to extend these anti-avoidance rules to family trusts from the 1st of July 2019. Just for some background, how does the currently closed health circular trust distribution rules work? Currently, the circular trust distributions can lead to non-tax payable if family trust is in a round robin agreement. Because current family trust excluded trust, it's not counted as a closed health trust, so it's not subject to these rules. However, these rules will change this, and yes, they, they, they hope to catch these round robin agreements. Uh, it's still only an exposure draft. Uh, once we have more details, we'll update you accordingly. Uh, there's been draft legislation on another budget proposal to disallow deductions for vacant land. Basically, this is proposed to apply from the 1st of July 2019, regardless of when land is acquired. So it's basically to normally, as you're well aware, if you have an investment property, you want to deduct the expenses on the mortgage payments, etc. With this proposal, they want to prevent people of deducting expenses only if it's vacant land. Um, note is <coughs> these restrictions will not apply if outgoings is incurred by property developers, primary producers, corporate tax entities, superannuation funds, or unit trusts or partnerships. Note, this is only draft legislation. Um, once there's a bill out, we'll be able to talk a bit more on more details. Another um, budget proposal that's now draft legislation, is a partnership may lose access to small business CET concessions. They want to make it more difficult for partners to access small business CET concessions. Basically, if they assign their interest to future partnership income to an entity not involved in the partnership. Small business CET concessions are only available on a transfer of membership interest. There'll be no concessions if you transfer income or capital that a partner receives from partnerships to other non-partner entity. There's also been an exposure draft on modern, modernizing business registers and director identification numbers. Uh, ASIC have cut down their exist 31 existing legal registers to a single platform with the ATO to be administered by the Australian Business Registrar. Director identification numbers, it's basically to enable these government agencies to check for unlawful and Phoenix activities. Some of the formalities, the new director needs to apply for a director identification number within 28 days, and the existing director 15 months to apply from when the new requirements start. It's all to prevent basically Phoenix activities where directors on purposefully um, they vanquish their companies or liquidate their companies so as not to pay superannuation guarantee or outstanding tax debt to their to first their employees and then to the ATO, but then it starts a new company in a different guise. So it's like a phoenix that rises up from the assets. With this director identification number provisions, they're trying to hold such directors personally liable. That's the whole rationale for these changes. 
Um, yeah, some quite a big development. Proposed changes to Division 7A from the 1st of July 2019. Government released a consultation paper on the 22nd of October 2018. Please note, um, I wrote um, a response, a submission. Uh, next year, tax group, we wrote a uh, submission on this discussion paper to Treasury. It should be available on the Treasury website. Normally, they release all these submissions because it's public knowledge. But anyway, um, you can read that. It's about six pages, so it's not a long. It's a, it's a, we wrote it quite condensed, uh, focusing on important issues. Should be relatively easy to follow. But I'm just giving you a broad overview here what 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 the suggestions are in the what they want to do to Division 7A. Note they propose these changes from the 1st of July 2019. Today it's the 10th of December 2018. We have an election coming up that must be held before May 2008, 2019. I don't know how government will pass um, this legislation. It will still need to go through different houses of parliament, etc. If we have a change in government or election, reconstituted cabinet, etc., don't know um, how efficient it will be for time. Um, but anyway, as it is currently, it's supposed proposed to apply from 1st of July. Um, only time will tell when the real date will be. Anyway, what they propose in these papers is simplified loan rules. They want to uh, replace a single 10 year loan. They want to repl replace the current seven or 25 year loan agreement. 25 year if you can secure the loan by property, seven year if you charge the benchmark interest rates, etc. They want to replace that with a 10 year loan. There are transitional rules, uh, quite complicated how it applies. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's just a consultation paper and I'm sure there will be changes, etc. But for more detail, you can look there or you can give me a call if you want to know more details or you can read our submission. For UPEs, um, as you're well aware, currently um, UPEs before 2009 will remain UPEs. UPEs after 16 December 2009, they're either a UPE if you put it on the subtrust op option or it becomes a loan if you do nothing. If it becomes a loan, you'll have to put it on seven year or 25 year complying loans, etc. The government want to get rid of all that UPE stuff. Okay, um, note UPEs before 16 December 2009, they've inquired on those. So we assume that will remain UPEs as is. So you must just watch out for subdivision EA. However, UPEs after 16 of December 2009 will now just be deemed to be loans. So the idea is all these loans, unless you put it on a complying agreement, that will be a 10 year agreement now under the new rules, you'll be subject to a deemed dividend. Third important issue, self-correction for inadvertent breaches. Currently, you must apply to the ATO to disregard or frank a dividend if you believe you've you know, made an unintentional mistake. There's a proposal, you should self-assess the eligibility for relief to reverse the effect of prior Division 7A deemed dividends. Um, so it's all self-assessment. You no longer need to get the commission involved, etc. Sounds great in practice, but what if someone messes that up? Um, how will the ATO react, etc.? There's also a, they propose a safe harbor for asset use because use of an asset, as you're well aware, um, is a payment. And a Division 7 8 dividend if this payment is not arm's length payment. So they propose a safe harbor just for valuation purposes to determine what should be the deemed dividend amount of this um, use of asset. Other matters, does Division 7A apply to foreign resident companies? They want to remove the concept of distributable surplus. Um, potentially that can have very far reaching effects. Company forgives debt owed by entity, loans made in the ordinary course of business, interposed entities and interaction with FPT rules. So they want to work on changes there as well. So this just gives you a broad overview. I believe Division 7A, because it has such a vast application in Australian tax landscape, they have to think very well and very carefully before they make any changes on this and there should be adequate consultation. 
next year will be involved in this uh, consultation. Moving on to the next issues, what to do when employing someone on a working holiday visa? As you're well aware, from the 1st of January 2017, backpackers on a working holiday visa, a new class 417 or 462 visa, will be taxed on 50% on all income up to 37,000 that they make. They abolished the 18,200 tax free threshold because only residents will qualify for this tax free threshold. If the backpacker does not provide a TFN, they'll be taxed at 45%. Employer obligations, there's mandatory registration process for employers. If they fail to register, the penalties on the employer and they must impose 32.5% of holding tax up to $87,000 of earnings. The Sharp Can case was a full federal court decision. <coughs> um, it concurs with the 14 December 2017 AIT decision. Uh, one of my friends, Daniel McEnany, was actually the barrister who featured in this case as well. It dealt with whether you, a taxpayer can deduct expenditure on gaming machine entitlements per Section 8.1. It's all to do with the capital and revenue distinction. Um, basically, in this case, there was a deferred payment for gaming machine entitlements that you had to pay to the, I think it was a Victorian case, to the Victorian state, to be able for a pub to have gaming machines in the pub. The previous year treatments of gaming machine entitlement expenditure was basically before 2016. This was deemed to be black hole expenditure, basically capital and deductible over five years. In 2016, it was held to be capital expenditure, or that's what the IATO thought. From 2017, the expenditure can be deducted under section, section 8.1 because the court, full federal court said, it is not capital because it is not for acquisition of a permanent asset. And it's like a fee paid for regular conduct of a business because the fee was paid to the government to conduct gaming at the client's premises. Therefore, it's on revenue account because it's outgoing only to preserve the revenue from gaming activities. So this expenditure paid to the government for the right to have gaming machines in the pub uh, is deductible under Section 8.1. <coughs> Moving on, our next topic is indirect tax issues. Here, PCG 2018-6, does our Australian tour operator act as an agent of a non-resident client? The question was per pertinent because what is the GST treatment of commission charge on services provided by an Australian tour operator to non-resident clients? Uh, for that, the answer to that question is a taxable supply. It will be a taxable supply if the operator acted as principal, i.e. not on behalf of non-resident clients. It will be GST free if the operator acted as an agent of the non-resident clients. So that is why it's important to know if the operator acts as an agent of the non-resident clients or not. So good GST treatment, i.e. GST free, if the operator is an agent of non-resident clients. There's some factors that will uh, the ATO will not examine whether or not the operator acts like an agent if there's a written agreement between the parties stating that the operator is an agent, the agreement with the third party states that the operator is an agent, the non-resident knows that they have to pay a commission to the operator because the operator acts as an agent, the booking cancellation fee is the lesser amount than the commission of the operator, the operator can give the non-resident client details of the transactions entered into, and the operator adopts the agency position for tax purposes. So basically, the ATO giving these different indicia, these six factors, if you can prove these six factors, you don't need to argue uh, whether the operator is an agent of non-resident clients or not. So it's just to help prove. There's a case, <coughs> IAT case, uh, SMHO, <coughs> said that the sale of development properties is subject to GST. In this case, there was a partnership that owned four different 
pieces, or I think the land, that land, it was subdivided into four different pieces. Existing buildings were on the first two blocks of land. Part of the old building is a business. If they sell the whole building, um, you'll have to apportion for the going concern exemption. Because there were two existing buildings that were used, two of the four buildings we used in the business, they couldn't qualify on the main residence exemption on the whole block. They could only qualify on half of the block of the two properties, not on all four properties. Blocks three and four, they built new buildings. That, that was a, when they sold them, there was a taxable supply with a margin scheme. And the acquisition cost does not include development cost. So note that. So that's a case relevant for property developers. <clears throat> Some sundry issues. From the 1st of January 2019, they've removed GST on feminine hygiene products. Um, there's a discussion paper, but it's now um, through government ordinance. It's, it is law. It applies from the from 1st of January 2019. Some tax issues affecting individuals. There's a bill um, dealing with reducing pressure on housing affordability. Um, yes, it's just all this main residence exemption issue. Um, I've heard it's actually currently stuck in the Senate, and it's 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 it doesn't seem to be. It probably won't go through this year in 2018, so we'll have to wait for 2019. That leaves the time, as you can see from the timeline, um, very little time for foreigners to really know what to do. Potentially, this bill proposes, if you're a foreigner, if you, let's say, I'm currently in Australia, I get a new job with Nexia Australia overseas, I own a house in Melbourne, I go overseas, and then I, once I've been overseas, and let's say I become a non-resident for tax purposes overseas, I then sell the house, I'll lose the main residence exemption. I have to pay CET on that. So because this legislation hasn't yet passed, it's proposed to apply from the 30th of June, 2019. Um, it can be potentially really, really, really bad for people who become non-residents and sell their houses. Hopefully we'll get an extension of the start date. Basically, just in short, if you bought a main resident or a house that you now use the main residence before the 9th of May 2017, you'll get an exemption from this new proposal. If you, if let's say you've moved overseas and became a non-resident for tax purposes and sell your house before the 30th of June, the main resident exemption will still apply. However, under the current bill, for such a house purchased before the 9th of May 2017 and you use it as a main residence, if you sell it after the 30th of June, you lose access. If you sell it uh, and, and at that time, you're non-resident for tax purposes, you lose everything, all of the main residence exemption, and you have to pay tax on that. Note, if you bought a house after the 9th of May, if you sell it, then you'll lose access to main residence. So, uh, it affects people who've hold, held houses for like countless years. Let's say you bought it just after CET was bought in, in 1986, post 85, you lose potentially all your main residence exemption on that house. As I mentioned, it's stuck in Parliament at the moment, um, and there's some, there's a lot of kickback against this proposal. Only time will tell um, whether they will do that. Um, the residential rental properties, note um, travel deduction changes from the 1st of July 2018, that was last year, as well as going forward in this year. If you go to your holiday rental to inspect it, you can no longer claim travel deduction costs, etc. Note, a reminder, don't include non-deductible travel expenses in your cost base or reduced cost base of the rental property. <laughs> Why mention it here? It's just because they released a new LCR 2018-7. Residential rental property travel expenses, some of the issues discussed in LCR 2018-7. Residential premises, what is it? It's land or buildings capable of being occupied as a residence for residential accommodation, uh, something that's fit for human cohabitation, a shelter and basic living facilities. 
and premises may be used in a number of forms. Carrying on a business exemption, uh, note if you carry on a business and you go to visit that uh, premises where you are carrying on a business, you can still deduct travel expenses to that premises. So here it just gives some indicia when you will be carrying on a business and therefore qualify for the non-restriction on deducting travel expenses to that um, property. Apportionment for mixed income purposes, income producing purposes, the expenses are non-deductible insofar expenditure related to travel. Therefore apportionment if mixed use, for example, if the uh, premises are used for business and for renting out, then there must be apportionment. <coughs> What is the tax treatment for compensation received for inappropriate advice? This is especially relevant with this new banking commission, the Royal Commission on Banking, etc. Uh, often firms have been asked to pay compensation. Examples of such compensation is compensation for the loss of investment, refund or reimbursement of fees, and then interest on these losses. How will the compensation for the loss of the investments be treated for tax purposes? If the investment is disposed, the compensation based, paid will amount to additional capital proceeds. Likewise, if the investment is not disposed, the compensation paid will reduce the cost base. How will the refund or reimbursement of advisor fees be treated? <coughs> if the advisor fees originally was claimed as a reduction, it will now be assessable income when it's refunded. If the advisor fee were not claimed as a reduction originally, <coughs> it will not be included in the assessable income. If the original advisor fee was included in the cost base of the investment, the cost base must be reduced by the amount of the refund or the reimbursement. The Douglas case, <coughs> that's an AAT case, where it's just an example of partnership income. It's income derived by partnership were caught by the PSA, PSI rule, personal services income rules. So some background to this case, include the income derived as a reward for personal efforts or skill in assessable income because it's personal services income. Exception to PSI income derived by PSI businesses, PSBs. Um, so normally they try to rely on this exception. However, um, they didn't satisfy these um, tests to determine whether you're a PSB. There's, um, what's it, five different tests, the results test, the 80% rule, the unrelated test, the employment test, and the business, uh, business premises test. So in this case, there was a labor hire firm and an engineering partnership. The business income was split equally between the taxpayer and the spouse. Basically, the court held, or the AAT, that uh, the income from this engineering partnership was subject to PSI because they failed the result test, because less than 75% of the income derived by this partnership was for producing a result. The income received was for work done and not for producing a result. So the Douglas case deals with PSI income. Tax treatment of industry assistance payments to taxi license holders. As you're aware, we now also have Uber and a lot of ride-sharing apps and ride-sharing services, etc. So taxis, <coughs> in the past, they always had to fork out a lot of money to get a taxi plate. Um, now with Uber, anyone can be an Uber driver, even myself. I can be an Uber driver. I don't need to pay much to be an Uber driver. So, of course, in fairness, they, they, they want to co compensate taxi drivers who paid for these taxi plates huge amount. Now the issue is, what is this accessible income? Tough luck, it is accessible as ordinary income. There's no CD discount. These payments or the, the receipts are not capital because the payments is not made in exchange for taxi license holders giving up or selling their taxi license plate or selling their taxi driving business. <coughs> Note this payment, luckily there's no GST consequences on making such a payment. Some sundry issues affecting individuals. Labor's proposal clamped down on unsubstantiated travel allowances to tax havens. 
if you don't have a tax agent, you have to lodge by the 31st of October. However, if you have a tax agent, uh, you can do it later. Note the tax debt need to be paid by need to have been paid by the 21st of November. International tax issues. There's PCG 2018-4 dealing with restructures to eliminate existing hybrid arrangement. I'm just going to mention it there. And then the Satyam case <coughs> is basically the 2016 Tech Mahindra case, where it was deemed an uh, Indian IT company that performed services in Australia, and then the Indian IT company derived income. Um, it was an Australian deemed source of royalties. Um, because here it dealt with how should this income be taxed, and because this income derived by the Indian company, um, and under the Australia India DTA, it was basically deemed to be two types of income. Could it be either business profits for activities carried on through the PE in Australia, the permanent establishment in Australia, or is it royalties for Indian technical services to Australian companies that were not carried on? through a PE. Some superannuation tax issues. Abolish the work test for 65 to 74 year olds uh, to make contributions from 1 July 2019. Back in October, there was some draft legislation out. The current position is 65 to 74 year olds must satisfy a work test to make voluntary contributions. The work test, you must work at least 40 hours or more in any 30-day period in the financial year. There's a proposal um, <coughs> for retirees with total super balance of less than 300,000 at the end of the financial year. They can make a voluntary contribution without passing the work test. So uh, if you have less than $300,000, you have some cash lying around, you make contributions to superannuation, you can do it or under the proposals, if it becomes law, you don't need to satisfy work test. How are superannuation benefit taxed? There's some factors that affect how the benefits will be taxed, the age of the deceased, whether superannuation come from a tax or an untaxed source, whether it's paid by lump sum or income stream. Uh, you can go through the slides to, dis to determine how a superannuation death benefit is taxed. And then T-bar reporting only applies from 1 July 2018 for SMSFs. 28 October was the due date for reporting, i.e. 28 days after each um, end of each quarter. When must SMSF lodge a T-bar? There's yearly T-bar reporting if your super balance is under 1 million and quarterly T-bar reporting if your super balance is more, 1 million or more. Um, moving on, PSLA 2018-1, how does the ATO measure if SMSF auditor complies with regulations? SMSF auditor must be a fit and proper person, lack of professional competency, dishonesty, disciplinary action, criminal convictions, will probably indicate you're not a fit and proper person. SMSF auditor, if your SMSF auditor is a member of SMSF, you're not a fit and proper person. If you breach the SIS obligations in a non-ordered auditor role, for example, if you're SMSF trustee, you probably won't be a fit and proper uh, person, and you might be disqualified, you probably will be disqualified as SMSF auditor. You must not contravene the SIS and fail to perform duties. And these rules apply from the 18th of October, 2018. Other tax issues, that's the last issue, we're almost finished. There's a discussion paper released on digital economy and the corporate tax system. <coughs> Problem, digital companies pay very little tax in the countries in which they do business. Australia has a high reliance on corporate tax, not so much GSD, so Australia has problems. There's some challenges and what's potential solutions. Note, this is only a discussion paper, um, so it's just a bunch of ideas how Australia can potentially get more tax. Proposals for an independent ATO board, um, the IGT, Inspector General of Taxation, when he made a leaving speech because he's retired, uh, proposed to split powers of the ATO so that not, not all power is concentrated in the commissioner. Specific suggestions, the independent chair, separate appeals commissioner, separate small business tax dispute area. 
the small business concessions, CET concessions, are one of the most difficult areas of the tax law. However, it's only aimed at small businesses. And normally those small businesses don't have all the money that big businesses have to pay for tax advice, etc., and to get proper tax advice. And if you dispute a position, it's also more money. So they propose a separate area for small business tax disputes. Um, yeah, some sundry issues, that's our last bit. Uh, Labor proposes to double fines, double the fines of the remote penalty regime. And there's some draft legislation to extend concessional draft beer excise right to smaller craft brewer kegs from the 1st of July, 2019. The Inspector General of Complation, uh, sorry, Inspector General of Taxation annual report some of the main complaints about the ATO is their debt collection action, delays in processing and refunds, the audits and their website. Anyway, my name is Rolf van der Meer, National Tax Director of Nexo Australia. My contact details are there and my phone number is there. If you have any questions, please give me a call and thank you very much for listening to me. Hello, Vicky. Thank Hi, Roloff. Thank you very much. That's the end Sorry. of the webinar. So today's session was recorded and will be found on the Rec and Training Academy. If you do have any questions, please email us at training at and we'll be able to assist you. Thank you for attending this session and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, Vicky. Bye.